Thanks for joining. My name is Darren Hart. I'm the director of the Open Source Technology Center at VMware. Um, and today we're going to talk about managing Linux kernel configs, specifically with uh, config fragments. So just as a general idea, how many folks maintain a Linux kernel config for a project, for a product, for... Okay. Whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, and so today we're going to talk about some tools that are available within the Linux kernel to try and minimize the amount of work and effort around that process. All right. Um, so, oh, this worked before. Here we go. Um, Linux is used broadly throughout the industry from phones to uh, servers to laptops to supercomputers. And the requirements of each of those is very different. So this is, this is the embedded track. Um, and so in that space, we particularly see uh, a wide variety of configuration types. Um, embedded is a lot less boring than PCs and, and servers. And so we see a, a, just a lot of diversity in the way that we create configuration fragments. So on the left, for anyone that's relatively new, uh, this is what uh, a few lines of a typical config looks like for the Linux kernel. Um, you'll see in the lower area here, 3,456 is the length of that particular dot config. Um, this is the largest number of unique config symbols in the Linux kernel, um, and it's not really going down. So over this period of time, except for the last couple, um, we've seen a continual increase in the total number of configs. Now, those of you that manage your configs are saying, whoa, whoa, we never use all of those. We use def configs for a given architecture, and that really cuts that down a lot. And you're right, takes it all the way down to here, which is still a lot. Um, and then you can say, okay, but I only do that once, and then I only have to do a diff each time for the, for the def config as it changes. Okay, sure, still smaller. 500 lines of difference between each one. Okay, but a lot of that's context, right? So really, in terms of actual changes, you're only talking about 100 or so, sure. And that's just to maintain the default. You have made no decisions, you haven't made any selections of configs yourself. Um, this is entirely every single kernel revision just to maintain a default config. So we can do better than that. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the kconfig language. So uh, kconfig is a mechanism that we use within the Linux kernel to be able to um, create dependencies and such throughout the various config symbols in the kernel. Um, on the right is an example kconfig file. All the config symbols within the kernel are created from these kconfig files. You'll typically find one in any major directory or subsystem. Um, and they're all created with a few general rules um, or a few general types. Uh, first, you have the name config and then the symbol name, which is the all caps bit that you see, and typically how we refer to the symbols. Um, everything has a type, and these are generally um, Generally, you see yes or module, or sorry, module or built-in, right? Um, so all these types are, are derivatives of tri-state or string. Tri-state is built-in, module, or no. Um, and then string is just that, it's a string. And then the other types are derived from those. A bool eliminates the module, and then you can create hex or, or, or int, int uh, numbers from the strings. The prompt, um, is the part that you read in menu config. Prompt is the user visible, user visible description of what this symbol is for. If it doesn't have a prompt, it doesn't show up in menu config. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. It means it gets uh, selected or something like that uh, in, a, in another way. And we'll talk about select in a minute. Um, there's a setting called default, and this, in, th this tells the configuration system whether or not the config should be enabled by default. Um, unless it's something that everybody uses, that's typically no. Um, depends is the way that we satisfy mutual requirements within the kconfig language. So if you want to write an I2C driver, 
you need to have I2C enabled. If you want to write, uh, if you're writing a, an ACPI driver, you need ACPI. Um, if you're creating drivers that only run on x86, then you might depend on x86. Um, but it gets more complex than that. So on the example on the right, you'll see um, depends on ACPI WMI or ACPI WMI equals no. So ostensibly, that's a little confusing, right? It, it says, I depend on either you have this feature or you don't have this feature. So that's a yes, right? Um, so depends means more than just this has to be there. Um, the depends statement means that if you want to build this driver or this feature, um, you have to, be, you, you, and you depend on this other symbol, then you cannot be, um, if, if that other symbol is built in, then you can be built in or module. But if that other symbol is a module, you can't be built in because you'll be missing the symbols at boot, right? So what that is saying is if symbol foo, then you have to follow up on whatever depends on that means. Or not symbol foo, foo and then we don't worry about it. It's a little bit confusing, but the reason I highlight it here is it's illustrative of the complexity of the kconfig language. And then finally, select. So select is that hand grenade that we throw into our configs that just breaks everything. So when you do a select, it's like a reverse dependency without dependency tracking. So you can select another symbol, but it won't go through and make sure that those select, that, that symbol's dependencies were satisfied. So you typically only use select for something that has no dependencies, and even better if it doesn't have a prompt. Um, because what that means is the user's not going to be able to go select it on their own. Um, so always be careful if you're defining selects or using, well, both defining and using selects. Okay, so if you'd like to know more, there's excruciating detail available in the documentation. Okay, so we're talking about managing Linux kernel configs. And so, bef and we're, we're typically, hopefully all of you doing that are doing so in revision control. Um, and if you're working with revision control, let's review what a good git commit is. A good git commit should start with a problem that should be defined. Why, why is this change necessary? Um, it should describe the intent of the, the, of the developer. This is the problem, and this is how I'm going about fixing it. This is what I intend to do. Then the changes should address the problem in a way that is consistent with the stated intent. And then number four is the most important part, right? It doesn't do anything else. And we'll talk about that uh, in this context. Okay, so let's take an example. Um, let's turn on the Dell SM BIOS driver. So all of you are familiar with menu config on the right. You type in make menu config, you open up that menu, you search through it, you check a couple of things, you go to exit and it says, would you like to save your changes? You say, of course, and it writes it to the dot config. So the diff created by this should indicate to me that I've made, that I've enabled those two drivers, right? That's the only thing I wanted to do here. That was my intent was enable Dell S and BIOS. So my changes should reflect that and nothing else. Huh. Okay, so in green, you see the three that I wanted, and then there's context, that's cool. But then there's all these other things. Um, and you might, and, and so things like the Dell WMI descriptor is set to a module, I didn't turn that on. But then you might say, okay, but all that other stuff is just comments, right? No, because when we, these are symbols, and we check to see if they are defined. The pound symbol is not set is effectively no, right? This is saying, I explicitly am saying that I don't want this thing. And so the reason that that's a problem is, let's say later you've got this Dell laptop, you just turned the Dell SM BIOS on, so you want to be able to come in later and turn on the Dell WMI LED. So you go and you look at the config, and what you realize is, hey, some developer in the past intentionally disabled the Dell WMI LED. They turned it off. But you're trying to turn it on. So now you need to know why did they turn it off. You want to know that, right? Because you're not just going to change what they did intentionally 
with something else unless you know, because if you turn that on to make your laptop work, you might break theirs, because you don't have their laptop to test. So this is where the managing a monolithic kernel config gets to be a real problem, because you're recording not only your intent, but also the artifacts um, that come out of uh, turning certain things on in the kernel config. Um, now, this was th these 57 lines, for example, though, keep in mind, that was to turn on one driver. So presumably, you're going to have 100 that you explicitly set for your project or your product. So now you have 5,000 lines of, of diffs that you're managing to turn on those. And then any time that the def config changes, your context changes. And as your context changes, you have to rewrite these patches too. So this gets to be a pretty ungainly um, thing to maintain. So what can we do differently? So let's start with what I want my diff to look like. So on the left, you have an example of what I would like my diff to look like. I, I have the three lines that I explicitly changed and nothing else. And I save this to a file that's called Dell SMBIOS, what did I call it? Uh, Dell SMBIOS WMI.config. So if I do that, then I can use, this is what I call a configuration fragment. And to be able to apply this, um, the Linux kernel build system knows how to merge um, configuration fragments. So if you look at the commands on the right, um, I do a def config and then check to see what the Dell SM BIOS is. So you can see it's is not set. And then I do a make def config Dell SM BIOS WMI.config. And so what that will do is merge the, conf the config fragment into your larger .config for you. And then we do, a, we do a test afterward with grep and look for SMBIOS, and we see that both Dell SMBIOS and Dell SMBIOS WMI are configured. And now if we build the kernel, we'll have that support. Now, the, the change is something that is independent of the def config. So not only do I only record the three things that I wanted to change, but unless the, unless the later kernel versions change the name of those symbols or add dependencies that you thus have to satisfy, you don't have to change that file ever. So you're able to maintain the, th the specific things that you wanted to change in a separate file, build the config, and then build your kernel. And so this makes your, your config management a much more explicit process, right? Um, that's good for you, that's good for people doing debug later, that's good for people doing code review. It's all a lot more explicit in what you're trying to do. <clears throat> okay, so what does it actually do? So the, the last one, I just piped all this to dev null because it's noisy. But um, if you look at what's happening here, I just run the same command again, based on def config, add my configuration fragment. So it says it's using the dot config as base, and then it's merging the Dell SMBIOS WMI config into the main config. And then it goes through each line one at a time, and it says, hey, this config fragment is overriding the previously defined value of symbol foo. Um, its new value is going to be this. And then it just walks through each one in, in your um, config fragment. And it'll do this for every config fragment that you specify on the command line. So you can have 100 of these, and it'll just, please don't have 100. But it, it'll go through each of these and, and give you a report out. Um, and then finally, it'll save that to your .config, and now you're ready to build. This is dependent on a script called merge config. Um, so uh, while I was at Intel, I spent a lot of time working on the kernel management uh, in the Yocto project. And this idea was kind of born from the way we managed that in the Yocto project. And I felt that, you know, config fragments, which we use in the Yocto project, are a great idea that should probably have an upstream counterpart. And maybe we can leverage that. So with a few other uh, developers outside of Intel, we wrote the merge config script. Um, and we merge that upstream. And since merge config has, yeah, merge config has become a part of the upstream build process. So MIPS uses it, PowerPC uses it. This is not an additional thing. This is upstream Linux. Uh, it's available there now, and it's used as part of the default build system. 
Um, so if you're not interested in explicitly generating the config and building your kernel and you just want to manipulate config files, you can use merge config um, directly. Um, it's in scripts kconfig, and it's got a few options there. A couple of things that you can do, um, my examples previously were all about using def config. But if you're working on embedded, uh, you probably have some uh, sensitivities to resources. You don't want a big kernel. You don't want a ton of modules. You want to keep this minimal. So you might start with all no config. Um, so that, that's the dash in uh, option up there. So you can start with all no config, which is all no. Right? And then you can add, I need this architecture. I need this machine. I need these drivers. OK. So a little bit about config organization. So as you can imagine, if you did a config fragment for every driver you wanted, you'd have way more than you probably wanted to manage. But if you did it all in one, then you kind of start having the same problem that we started with. Um, so the Yocto project, which I think does a really good job at the way they recommend doing configuration management, breaks things up generally like this. So I'm going to use the same example. Um, there's certain policy decisions that you make when you're creating your um, Linux kernel for your projects. You might decide on which file systems you use or which crypto um, algorithms you're going to support, which networking stacks. Those are all policy decisions that you make. And that can be one configuration fragment. Another might be the architecture. Um, you could use a def config, but maybe you don't want to use that entire def config, which is usually more like this works on my server or my, my general PC or something like that. If you have a very targeted device, your architecture definition might be considerably smaller, more restrictive. Uh, so if you're pairing this with a no config, having an architecture fragment is a good idea. Um, and then from there, if you have board-specific things, so which, which buses do you have and which specific drivers are on board, that's where you can put those kinds of configurations. And then if you're working on a device that is not locked down but might have users adding or removing things to it, um, that's where the general drivers work. So things like um, USB webcams are a really good example. Like which ones of those do you want to support? Um, and then... Finally, looking forward, as I was creating this presentation, I, I noticed a few things. Um, creating your configuration fragments is currently manual. So you go in there, and you go through menu config, and you search, and you find the one that you want, and then you go type it into the file, and you say what you want it to be. And um, it'd be really nice if I could go into menu config and have it record which things I check yes module on, and then just when I exit, it says, do you want to save your config? Maybe it could instead say, would you like to save your fragment? That would be really nice, right? It just generates that for me. Not all the things that changed, just all the things I intentionally changed. I don't care about all the things that got checked by default. I'm accepting the defaults. These are just the things that I changed. I wanted to write that on the plane because Dave Hansen shamed me into not having had a 30,000 foot commit, but my flights got all screwed up. And I didn't get that done. So um, maybe on the way back. Um, and then another thing I noticed was merge config can silently fail. Um, so if you add something that has, uh, it, it doesn't know about, um, rather than saying, hey, you tried to config this to that and it didn't happen, it's quiet about it. Um, and I, I noticed that last night and I didn't actually uh, nail down exactly what's happening. So that's something we can work on fixing. Um, and then something like make audit config, uh, where you pass all your config fragments after it where it can go through and then verify, are any of these things that you've asked for not in the dot config? Um, seems like it would be a pretty useful tool for some of our um, uh, CICD processes when people are changing the configs. So those are my thoughts on what we might do in the future. Um, and that's the content that I had to share with you today that leaves us with um, a little over five minutes for questions. I've got a live. Um, system up. If you had specific questions or you wanted to see how some, some things worked, we could go through. But if you have questions, I've got some folks with mics that'll happily walk them back down. So we've got some questions. Let's start going through questions here on the left. Um, and uh, Suzanne, over to uh, Alex. No? <laughs> uh, up here in front. So what I wondered about the configs, uh, that, like Docker uses them, 
isn't, couldn't be in some cases the order be significant, and how does Yocto decide in which order it uses those, those conflicts? Okay. Does the order matter? Yes, the order matters. So each, each subsequent one can override the prior. Um, I would recommend that when you have these, that you apply them in this order as well. Um, but this is also why I think that the make audit config is something we should work on because then you can, because be, something I forgot to mention was your, your fragments can indeed be contradictory. And if they are, it's something you should be aware of. Yeah, good question. And that's not Yocto specific, that's upstream, but yes. Um, Hello, um, do you think you could? Sorry, one sec, Bart, there's a question. Uh, oh, let's take the mic over to him in the back. Go ahead. Uh, do you think that this kind of merge config system could be used for something else that uses a similar config system, say build root? Build root, busy box, yeah. Anything that's k-config based. Yep, right next to you. Yeah, okay. Um, I was having the question whether you could only enable uh, config symbols or also disable them. Oh, yeah, good question. You can also put pound config symbol is not set. That's the same thing as saying no. Yep. Hi, Tern. Um, Hi. Is there or do you have any easy way to trace back when uh, a dependency is not met? Because when you, when you merge it, you say, it says uh, something didn't get enabled, but it was on the config, right? But it, it only tells you like the last thing that wasn't enabled for it to be enabled. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. trace back the whole dependency chain. The, it's a really good question. I think it's something we'd all like. It's something that the Octo project has struggled with too. Yeah. Um, and one of the problems with that, there's a term that we use um, that describes the type, of prob the, the type of problem that a dependency chain is, and I don't remember the term. Um, but the, the problem is you might have be, be, well, you will have a number of depends on this or that. And then that gets made more complex by each of those having a depends on this or that. And so if you say enable this and it says I can't because the dependencies aren't met, the, what we'd like it to do is say please go enable this. Unfortunately, that is please go enable this and this or that and this and, and that parentheses or this and that unless you're arm and then do this unless you're ex so, no. Uh, the, I think the best that we can do there is do the make audit config um, and then maybe provide some how-tos on how to do that spelunking, basically, through the configs. Unless somebody else has a brilliant idea on how we can fix that. <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> oh, I hate these things. Yeah, say, well, what I use right now in Yocto, it's the, the Python kconfig uh, lib. And it now can, up to 418 plus, parse all those dependencies so when it fails, so you don't make it in the final config, it is, does a pretty good job of going back and saying, you missed this dependency, this was selected, or that, and it, you can do that splunking in Python and dump it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to catch up with the after and see what's possible there. Thanks. In the back. Can you create um, umbrella fragments that include other fragments? No, right? I don't, I don't think we have any kind of an include system right now. Config fragments are strictly fragments of dot config. So nothing more than config symbol or pound config symbol is not set. Is that, anyone know differently? I, we considered that um, and what the, the Yocto solution to that is a one higher level language that wraps that, that allows you to create those includes. But in terms of the mainline Linux merge config tooling, we do not have that. Uh, what about the options that get um, enabled by default when you enable or disable some other options? What about those? So that yeah. is a really good question, and that is what I was trying to illustrate here. So that's basically what all those red things are. And that's the additional context that you didn't intentionally change, but that got added to the dot config. Um, and so the approach that I'm recommending is that don't worry about the defaults let the, because you didn't specify them. Let, this, let, let that be managed by the system. Only explicitly state what you care about, which is in green. And then if you 
when, when you go back and you look through your config later, you might find that, hey, this is disabled or enabled things that I cared about, and then explicitly add those into your config fragments. Yeah? In the back. Uh, uh, one uh, different question. Could you use uh, these fragments to build a graph of uh, driver dependency uh, at runtime? Sorry, one more time. Uh, could you um, use these fragments as a, some hint uh, to the kernel when it probes drivers that we have something uh, exactly present on the platform you would like to run this kernel on? Oh, that's a good idea. I don't think we have anything like that now, but yeah. We could. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Just a small notice. Uh, there is a tricky word, uh, imply, f in kconfig. Uh, so uh, uh, when, when, uh, when some option um, enables or disables another option if it was not explicitly set. It is uh, not depend, but yeah. imply. And uh, I wanted to ask whether your script, while switching on and off the options, um, report about changing implied options. So it is, it is uh, the dependency, but it is a weak dependency. It's a weak dependency, yeah. So for pe people wondering, um, go look here. It'll talk about imply. I was trying to decide, do I add imply or not? I thought it was probably a little more special case. Um, this doesn't handle uh, select or imply any differently than um, if you were to just change the config manually. Because right? all this does is merges um, explicit statements. So it, doesn't, it won't report out on anything on what, what you, if you selected anything or implied anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, we ha have three more minutes. We're okay, because we're, we're, we are past, but um, if we're, I don't think there's anything conflicting in the room, so unless they kick us out. Uh, I think we have one up there, and then uh, aren't up here for the next mic. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I think the defaults are actually a problem, because when uh, you bump your kernel version, uh, the defaults may change. Yep. So just doing that, uh, yeah, your intent is, has, is, is, is not applied anymore. And I don't think there's any good solution for that except for comparing the full config, which is horrible. It, so you're, um, he makes a good point, which is when you do change your, your base kernel version, you're going to get a bunch of new defaults. This is much less a config fragment management problem and more of, uh, hey, as maintainers, we need to be doing a better job at not enabling things by default that we shouldn't. I got corrected um, a few months back about having way too many default yeses in the platform drivers x86. Um, you might notice a patch from Linus that, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> uh, um, the equals no, not the, anyway. Um, so that is something that as kernel maintainers, we need to try and do a good job at uh, avoiding that bloat of the default yes. Um, but otherwise, you, you do need to do a compare. If your kernel size grows, hopefully you're watching that in your CI CD and you're able to come back and say, what do I need to turn off? And unfortunately, yes, that means adding a number of uh, config symbol is not set. Aren't so I'm, I'm missing a feature to turn on a symbol more, but not less. So we, for example, we, we might want to test DRM drivers and enable them as modules on ARM, but apply the same config fragment on x86 where setting DRM from yes to module would just lose the console. So we don't want to make it, we don't want to make it module on x86, we want to leave it at yes, mm -hmm. but on ARM we would want to make it module if it isn't already on, but we don't want to build it in because that just bloats the kernel. So that to me sounds like something you, because it's architecture specific, you'd want to include it in an architecture fragment as an well, explicit statement? The, the idea was that uh, we have a couple of those and it's always uh, a fragment that is in principle architecture independent. So we have a fragment that we want to use for running um, K-self-test 
Mm -hmm. So having a K-self-test fragment should not depend on the architecture. We don't want to have the whole matrix of all architectures and all K-self-test tests. Yeah. But just having some way of saying, apply this fragment, but if it says equals M and it's already enabled, then don't uh, turn it off. Don't make it less. Don't make it less. Yes. That's a good suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> You, you mean patches welcome? Yeah. No, I, I mean, let, let, but catch me after. I, I can't actually write everything down right now. Or send me an email, because that's, that's a collection of things I'd like to, I'd like to have. OK. Um, I haven't kicked us out yet. Any, anyone else? OK. Um, everybody, thank you for coming. I appreciate the questions. Feel free to, well, it's not up here now. Um, but feel free to email me, dvhard at vmware.com. Um, if you have any other thoughts or questions or suggestions. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.